And um, the title uh, or the, the part of scripture that I want to focus on today for the message is found there in the first five verses of Romans 4. And it's found in the first five. So let's go ahead and just read that really quick. And it says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And so, the, so we see there, before I even give you the title of the message, that it's very clear. These are probably uh, the two set of verses that really stand out to me. Because uh, the topic I'm going to preach about today, it, just, uh, it was something that I struggled to understand. And now I understand why I struggle. Because there's so much misinformation out there. And that's the purpose of what I'm going to show you today. But for some reason, everybody, you know, the, the word stands out to everybody at different times in, in different uh, uh, stages of their life. And I don't remember if, uh, if it was told to me directly or I heard it through one of the sermons. But when I read these set of verses, uh, when it was being preached somewhere, they just really stood out as just a, another set of verses that really stand on the word that it's not by works, but by faith, because it's just so clear to me, maybe because I come from a financial background and I understand, you know, the debt instruments and things like that, or maybe it's just because that's just the way God wanted me to understand. But it says in verse 4, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. In other words, to work for something, for a salvation in Jesus Christ, it'll always be counted or reckoned, accounted for, as a debt. That means something you're never going to get out of. You're always owing interest. You're always amortizing. But it says in verse 4, uh, verse 5, it says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So in other words, there's no work, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, Jesus Christ, his faith is counted for righteousness. And the title of my message today is, I titled it, Repent of Your Sins Conspiracy. And the reason that I, I titled it like that is because I really believe that it's more than just a lie in the sense that, you know, when if I, for example, came to church late uh, one morning and, and a brother in Christ asked me, you know, why was I running late? You know, and maybe my ego or I was embarrassed and so I just told a lie about why I, I was late to church. You know, the, the sin is in the lie and the malice, the the ego or the selfishness behind it, but there was no conspiracy to, uh, you know, overthrow or usurp that person. It was more of just a, a, a moment of weakness. But a conspiracy, if we go to the, just a, a basic definition of the word conspiracy, you know, it's a combination of men for evil purpose, an agreement between two or more persons to commit some crime in concert, particularly a combination to commit treason or excite sedition, or insurrection against the government of a state, a plot, uh, or as a conspiracy against the life of a king. And, and the, the plot here, or the, against the life of somebody, is the life of Jesus Christ. And of course, it's against the gospel itself. A conspiracy is, you know, in law, an agreement between two or more persons, falsely and maliciously to indict or procure to be indicted an innocent person of felony. And we know that obviously there was a conspiracy against Christ, to uh, you know, nail him to the cross, but also there's a conspiracy against the words of the Lord and the way that the Lord uh, uses those words and the way that the devil has convinced society to uh, to use them. And, you know, so the narrative that the world, you know, people use the word conspiracy and they always think of some crazy kook sitting behind a computer on YouTube all the time. But really, if we just stick to the word conspiracy, it's just a a group of people that are bringing some kind of lie or uh, twisting the truth for, for a purpose of overthrowing something. And in this case, what they're trying to overthrow is that salvation is faith alone. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. You know, so that, you know, it's not of, uh, and let's go there to Ephesians real quick. I don't, I'm getting ahead of myself. But if you go over to Ephesians 2.8, 
you know, we, we use these all the time, but I'm so uh, excited about the, the message that, uh, to be honest with you, I got ahead of myself and I apologize. But if you go there to Ephesians 2.8, we can let the Bible just, you know, clear this up for us. It says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So it's just backing up this, and we're going to be there in a little bit. But, you know, another you know, definition of conspiracy is just the act of conspiring and evil, unlawful, treacherous, or surrep... Uh, so another uh, treacherous plan formulated in secret with two or more persons. Another thing that we see here is that it's formulated in secret. You know, the Bible hides nothing. It's, it's light to the world, but the conspiracy will veil the truth in darkness. And so this repent of your sins conspiracy is a conspiracy to confuse you not only on the word repent, but also on what the word means and what they actually mean by repent of your sins. First of all, the very first thing I want to make a point on is that you're never going to find the word, I mean the term repent of your sins in the Bible. And I actually went through, you know, and I, I looked up every, every variation of the word repent. So the word repent itself is used 43 times. This is, I mean, I'm sorry, it's used 43 verses, and it's used 46 times in those 43 verses. The word repented is used 30, it's, a, it's in 32 verses, and it's used 32 times. The word repenteth is five verses, it is used five times. Repentines is one verse, one time. Repentance is 26 verses, 26 times. Repentest is one verse, one time, and repentine is one verse, one time. So we have a total of 85 verses with 88 mentions of the word repent, of some variation of it. And let me tell you, none of those use the word repent, or that, the phrase repent of your sins. So real quick, we start running into an issue with what the world tries to tell you, repent of your sins means and that it's crucial to salvation versus what the Bible teaches repentance is and how it's tied to salvation. And that's really the goal of today is to show you that, you know, the false religions of the world, the uh, false prophets will get you to believe on something stupid so that you can't believe on Jesus Christ. And, and it's so ingrained society that when we go out soul winning, people will tell you that they believe, but that they also have to repent of their sins. As a matter of fact, today, just today alone before this message, the last person I spoke to said, oh no, I believe in everything. Let me take them through the entire gospel pre presentation. They're like, but I still think that you have to repent. And when you try to pin them on that repentance issue, like repent of your sins, or what does that really mean to you, they really can't tell you. Because you show them clearly, verse after verse, it says believe, and believe, and believe. And they're like, yeah, believe, but I still think. See, that cl that's a clear statement. That that's a statement that we need to hold people accountable. Is It's what you think, not what the Bible says. It's, I think that I still need to repent of my sins, or I think I still need to live a good life. But the reality is, the Bible says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. If you go to John 8, verse 44, uh, if you just want to turn there really quick, before we get into the, the gist of this, is in John 8, 44, it says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. And so we see here that there is a conspiracy that goes all the way to the devil and the people that he's influencing or he's controlling to get you confused and muddy the water, uh, muddy the waters when it comes to the gospel presentation. And you know, the reason that I'm preaching this is twofold. Number one, you know, I believe that if you're saved by grace and you want to start growing in Christ, there's only one conclusion you can come to is that if you're seeking truth, the only truth you will accept is the truth of the Bible. You know, I was talking earlier this morning to someone or a group of uh, people in the church, and I was letting them know that, you know, there's groups out there that are called truth seekers and, the, you know, the skeptics, and there's even associations and clubs and all that in the country that they're looking for truth. But the reality is I think those groups are really, what they're doing is they believe they have some sense of truth in their, in their heart of what they decided was a truth or a morality that they believe should exist or be constant. And then what they're looking for is justification for that truth. Uh, it's like when I'm in business, I got a call earlier this week from a guy that uh, he has a call from an investor that wants to give him $100,000 to invest in his business. 
And so he's like, look, I know you do business consulting. Will you come sit with me so I can explain the situation? I want to get your advice on what I should do. Now, this was just a, a talk. I didn't charge this guy for anything. Uh, but when we sat there, you know, I told him the reality is you have a good business. You don't need to take this money from this man. And he kept coming back to the issue of well, what would I do if I got the 100? How would I set up the terms? Bottom line is I told him and I said, Jimmy, you know, the problem is that you asked me here because you have already convinced yourself that you want the $100,000 and all you want me to do is justify why you should take the money. And I told him the reality is I can't do that. I'm going to tell you the reality of things. And I really think that the best option for you is to grow your business slowly and not jump the gun. Well, it's the same thing when it comes to truth. You know, the reality is most of the times when people are seeking truth or asking questions from a pastor or looking to the Bible, the first thing they do is they've already made up their mind of what they're looking for, and then they're looking to the Bible to justify their truth. And the, the reality for me is when I'm looking for an answer is I'm looking for God to explain it. And I know that sometimes, you know, it's not always, I'm not always going to feel great about it initially, but I know that God has a purpose for the things that, that he's teaching us. And then number two is, you know, uh, as, as I've grown in, in, in Christ and then I got ordained and, you know, I've, I've gone out soul winning and, you know, now I associate with, uh, you know, other like-minded believers and preachers throughout this country. You know, one of the things that you hear constantly is this uh, hard preaching against the repent of your sins uh, doctrine or the repent of your sins teaching. And, um, you know, I have other friends that aren't necessarily a new IFB or or hard preachers or anything like that, or, or maybe acquaintances, but also have friends. And I have a, a friend of mine who is a friend uh, who's a missionary in Korea. And he's actually exposed me to, to some truths that were hard for me to accept. But once we saw it in the Bible, you know, I accepted them over time. You know, for example, uh, many years ago, I used to think that the Jews were the chosen people, you know, and that you know, the Jews had a promise for themselves and there's a promise for the Gentiles because that's all we ever heard. And, you know, I was still new to the ministry. Actually, I was still new to the faith and nobody had really explained and I hadn't really read my Bible through and through. And he was the one, uh, this friend of mine was the one that brought to light, you know, the, the verses in Revelation. And even this, in Romans 4, we see, you know, the circumcision and the uncircumcision and that it was counted to, uh, to uh, uh, righteousness was counted to Abraham not uh, during the circumcision, but before. And we'll read those verses here shortly. But uh, one of the things that he, that I, uh, as I was growing in this ministry and, and I was uh, supporting these soul winners and these marathons and things like that, is, you know, you have conversations with people. And I'd be like, hey, you know, I'm going to this event, uh, you know, with uh, Pastor Steven Anderson or Pastor Roger Jimenez or whoever, Pastor Manley here in Houston, I mean, in San Antonio. And he's like, you know, I think that guy is great and he preaches truth or those guys are great. But I think that there might be an issue with the way that they preach against repentance. I said, well, you know, I think I understand what they're trying to say, but I don't know that it's really an issue because I don't, you know, I know that it's by faith alone. They, they preach faith alone. I really don't get this whole repentance thing. So what it prompted me to do was to search the scripture and to figure out what it is that we're dealing with here. And it's actually a lot deeper and a lot more sinister than uh, you know, most people will give into. You know, so this is let, let's let's take this all the way to the beginning of the journey. You know, I got saved in 2005. I've told you that many times before. But uh, the church that I was attending at the time was Christ Church Baptist Fellowship. Now, there's a couple of things that you need to know about my salvation experience. Number one, the pastor of that church, Pastor Johnny Pope, led me to salvation. He's the one that reaped that salvation, but the reality was the one that did the work was this friend that I'm speaking of that's in South Korea. And he's the one that prompted Pastor uh, Pope to meet with me for breakfast and give me the gospel presentation because he knew that I wasn't saved. So number one, the first red flag is, there's two, there's a good flag and a red flag. The red flag is that even though I had attended the church on several occasions, Nobody had approached me about my eternal security. But number two is, it wasn't until somebody who's actually a soul winner forced the issue that I got saved. So what I'm trying to say is, this is so, repentance is like a cop-out. 
because people don't want to go through the whole thing because what it becomes is you become, the first thing you're going to notice is people get a little self-righteous because they pick and choose the sins that you've got to repent from. You know, they think that as long as they're living a good life and they're not murdering people and they're not drinking and doing drugs, then those are the people that need to repent of their sins, you know, because they're in church and they're tithing and they're doing things. So they might not spend as much time working with you until they see some change in you that gives them an indication or a clue that now you're ready to accept the gospel. You know, that's, that's the, the, the first red flag. But the second red flag is, okay, whatever. You know, there's a lot of people like that. Thank God that we have soul winners throughout this country that aren't looking for that excuse because I can't tell you how many drunks and drug dealers and tattooed people and probably drug dealers and whoremongers and all kinds of wickedness we've talked to that have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. And there probably isn't an immediate change, but we know that the seed is there and the potential is there for them to go out there and do great things for the Lord. But here's the, the second thing. If you go, so I wanted to go all the way back to the beginning, right? When I got saved, this is the church that I attended for many years. And I went to their, their statement of faith and in the Statement of Faith, they talk about salvation. They have a section on salvation, just like any church would. And in there, they're talking about, you know, uh, the pastor wrote in there that salvation includes regeneration, sanctification, and glorification. Okay, he's going a little bit deeper than most. You know, he is, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, he is an uh, in the old IFB preacher. And he, you know, he goes by the name of Dr. Johnny Pope. So, and, and he studies a lot about theology and eschatology and all that. He's very smart. And so maybe this, that's why he did all this. Let me first say that I don't think Pastor Pope is unsaved because he led me to the Lord. I just think that he muddies the water when it comes to the salvation. If you read it, it says, it is a change of heart. I mean, in the part it says, a work of God's grace whereby believers become new creatures in Christ Jesus. Okay. It says, it is a change of heart wrought by the Holy Spirit through conviction of sin. So we're already running into issues there. To which the sinner responds in repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're responding in repentance, you're moving, you're turning from your faith to God's faith, then I don't have a problem with that, that type of repentance, right? If faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance and faith are inseparable experiences of grace. And then this is the challenge. Repentance is a genuine turning from sin toward God. So the challenge is that you people use this term, repent of your sins, without giving you any more information. I mean, the way that it reached to me, because now that I understand, I'm going to give you the definition. Repent, literally, in its most uh, simplest term, just means to turn. Meaning, I was going this way, and now I'm going this way. That doesn't mean that I stop sinning. It just means that I turn direction in something that I was doing or in the direction that I was headed. But here, repentance is a genuine turning from sin toward God. Well, what sin and how much sin? And was there a wall of sin that I was running into and now I'm turning towards God? So if sin is on one side and God is on the other? Or is it not that we live in the flesh and we're surrounded by sin and we're constantly under the attack of the devil? But, but then the challenge is, because, you know, I never really had an issue with repenting, your, like when people would say repent or repent of your sins. Like, I understand where I understood the sermons as they were preached by others that were preaching hard against this. But what I'm trying to say is that I was confident and I was secure in my eternal security. Because the one thing that stood out, you've heard me say this before, is uh, after I got saved, the pa pastor Pope said, now you have perpetual rest. So it meant to me that it was forever, that I was never going to lose it. I understood that from day one. Well, it makes sense because then later on in their, in, in their statement of belief or in that, for that church, it says eternal security, which is what we're for. We're for the eternal security of the believer. And it says, or here in their thing, it says, believers may fall into sin through neglect and temptation whereby they're grieved by the Spirit impair their graces and comforts, bring reproach on the cause of Christ and temporal judgments of self, yet they shall be kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. So there's a contradictory statement in the statement of faith from saying you got to turn from your sin and repent or turn from your sin, but then you may fall into sin. So then my question is, which one is it? 
Is it that I'm going to turn from my sin, or is it that I'm going to fall into sin, but I'm still saved forever? So I'm glad that I never went to their statement of faith after I got saved, because this probably would have confused me. And then, uh, you know, I don't know that I, I wasn't reading my Bible at the veracity or the, the, the frequency that I read it now, so that might have caused doubt or, or, uh, or fear or unbelief. I don't know. It might have, not unbelief, but it might have caused, because uh, one's saved, always saved, but it might have... It might have muddied the water for me, is what I'm saying. So this is, this is the kind of thing that I'm, that I'm talking about. So then the next step in my process was, well, okay, what about false religions? I mean, it, it seems like the only people I hear from is, uh, you know, hard Baptist preachers who are preaching against maybe like watered-down Baptist preachers or some false religions, but they, you know, I hadn't really gone into the specifics. So then I said, you know what, let me just go into it. And so just know, this is really a goal of, if you're going to search for truth, this is one way for you guys to go do this. And what I'm trying, my, my end goal is for you to understand that, there, that if you're going to seek for truth, you're going to look for it in the Bible. And then when you see other religions or faiths or, or preachers and it doesn't match up, then you've got to make a choice. And honestly, when you're saved by grace and, and you're a Bible-believing Christian, the choice is easy. You, you, you stand on the Word of God. But let's go through this. And, you know, we could do a whole sermon on each one of these religions and what they believe repentance of faith is. And it's very confusing. Now I understand why this battle cry is so strong. You know, it really messes things up for people. And as a matter of fact, the, the individual I talked to today, right before we had this message, you know, it's almost, uh, you know, not almost. God knew that I was going to preach this message and He gave me good, you know, He just gave me good fodder. For the fire, I mean, he just gave me good uh, uh, a coal or fuel for this fire. The guy let me go through the entire presentation, everything that I go through. You know, the belief, the sin, the gift, the future, past, and present sins, and that if you sin if five years from now and you murder someone, but you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, if you die, you're going to heaven or hell. He says heaven, and then. You know, if, if uh, can you ever lose your salvation? No. You know, if it's eternal, when can God take it away? Never. Great. Hey, Carlos, you know, let's pray. Let's, let's take you through the, the, the prayer. It's just a simple prayer I like to lead you. He goes, no, because I still think that I need to clean up some stuff in my life. And I said, but we just read. Believe, believe, believe. And actually it was in Spanish. So it was like, creer, creer, creer. Believe, believe, believe. I showed him verse after verse. He's like, yeah. I know you're showing me that, but I still think that's clean up some stuff in my life. And it's because you get all these false religions with these false doctrines. So let's, let's not belabor the subject here. The first one is, uh, you know, that I, that, I, that I decided to pick on, <clears throat> and I picked on eight, is the Seventh-day Adventist. We all know I'm a former Seventh-day Adventist, so that one was pretty easy. If you go to their, their 27 beliefs, you know, one of them, I think it's number 10, is salvation. And it says, in infinite love and mercy, God made Christ. Well, we already got an issue there, because God didn't make Christ. So already, there's a false doctrine there. Already, there's a blasphemy there. Already, there's a satanic leaning there. See, Seventh-day Adventist is a satanic cult. And then, you know, that, that's dear and near to my heart, because for many years, I worshipped under the guise of thinking I was going to heaven, and imagine if I would have died without knowing Jesus Christ, I'd be in hell forever. Think about the thousands and millions of Adventists that have died under the guise of thinking that if they just go to church on Saturday and if they follow the commandments and if they repent of their sins, they're going to go to heaven. But it says there, God made Christ who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in Him we might be made the righteousness of God. And it says, led by the Holy Spirit, we sense our need acknowledge our sinfulness, repent of our transgressions, and it's repent of your sins. I mean, later on, I didn't, that's what I'm saying. I could have just, there's more. I just had to pick the most concise for the sake of time. Now, if not, this sermon would be like four hours long. It says, and exercise faith in Jesus as our Savior, as Savior and Lord, substitute an example. So what they're basically saying is that, you know, you, the Bible says, draw an eye to God and he'll draw an eye to you. But here, they're saying that you're led by the Holy Spirit. So who's led? And does the Holy Spirit pick everybody? I mean, who is he picking and choosing? It almost sounds like a Calvinist uh, doctrine here. But, you know, we're not going to talk. I'm not going to go into all that. That's a whole other sermon for a whole other day. But then later on in that same uh, paragraph, it says, 
Through the Spirit we are born again and sanctified. The Spirit renews our minds, writes God's law of love in our hearts, and we are given the power to live a holy life. The Bible says we're given eternal life, not a holy life. And last I checked, the Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For there is not one righteous, no, not one. So yeah, we can lead, uh, we can grow in grace, and we can start being more righteous in the sense that we're working on our walk with God, but that is independent of our salvation. And even then, when we have even our best days, we're still sinful. We're still sinning. We still have the sin nature. You know, we still have the corruptible flesh. Now, we have the incorruptible spirit, but we have the corruptible flesh. So, I mean, and then the worst part is, I mean, that's just what I picked. You know, you could just type in, like, on their PDF, because that's the way that I did it. You know, you download the PDF, and it's 27 beliefs. It's, like, several pages long. And if you just click, you know, Control-F, and you put Repent, it's just like one after another after another explanation of repent. They, they confuse the issue, and they confuse the salvation process. You know, Mormons, we know that's another false religion that's easy to pick on for anybody who believes on Christ and has studied. Mormonism is a false religion that is kind of nutso all in itself. Uh, you know, I wish we had time to go into that, but they have this thing called Doctrines and Covenants. And in, doc in the Doctrines and Covenants, section 20.37, they say that in order to be baptized, all those who humble themselves before God and desire to be baptized and come forth with broken hearts and contrite spirits and witness before the church that they have truly repented of all their sins. Then we go to Doctrines and Covenants 58.43 and it says, By this ye may know if a man repenteth of his sins, behold, he will confess them and forsake them. So another, here's the other issue. And the challenge is that these are the false religions I'm picking on, but the problem is that this type of mentality has permeated even evangelical circles that are preaching salvation by grace, but then they're telling you you have to forsake your sin. You know, for that word forsake means abandon. It means to stop. It means to not do that anymore. So it says that they're saying that when you stop, like you're literally just giving up it. The, the equivalent of, you know, forsaking something would be like if I just never showed up to my house one day, never called my wife and my kids, they never heard from me, they never knew what was on, and I just decided to go to another part of the world and have another type of, uh, you know, family and work and everything, and I just forsook them completely. Well, that, that's not going to happen. Well, number one, that's not going to happen, but it's a, I have to use an extreme example. You're not going to forsake all your sin. The Bible says we're tempted. You know, there's a temptation that's common to man. So if there's a temptation that's common to us, how are we going to forsake the fact that sometimes we're going to fall into that temptation? You know, then, then we went, I went down the line because I picked on all the 1800s first, right? Jehovah's Witnesses. <coughs> and uh, their definition of repentance is so confusing, it wasn't even worth the time. I mean, that was the worst one. They were talking about repenting of your sins, that if you really truly repent of one specific sin, not only do you repent of it and ask for forgiveness, but you stop the sin, and then you've got to go to the elders of the church, and you've got to make sure that you really did repent and you cleared it up. And I mean, I guess I wasn't going to go into it, but like, I didn't get any quotes from them because there were so many quotes, like every other sentence was repenting of something. And then one repenting sentence didn't make sense to the other repenting sentence. And it was just a, you know, a, a big confusion. Then I actually went outside of the so-called religious circles, meaning those that supposedly call themselves Christian. I just, I just did a, a, just do a Google search for Buddhism and repent of your sins. And they actually, you know, have stuff on that. It says here uh, in the Nirvana Sutra, it is said that evil karma dissipates due to confession and repentance. It is important to note that repentance is not merely regret, remorse for a past misdeed, but crucially it entails an honest resolve to abstain from repeating the misdeed. In other words, the same thing for forsaking. You know, the Bible is very clear that we are sinners, and it's very important not to pick on someone and berate them and make them feel bad for being sinners, we all know we're sinners, but it's very important to remind them that we are sinners and that we're lost because the only saving grace is the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, it's, it, it, it's, it's preposterous and it's arrogant for you to think that you 
have this supernatural power to stop sinning, that to stop doing the thing that the corruptible flesh can never stop doing until it dies, or can't stop doing it until it dies, because never, I mean, at some point it's going to stop, right? You're either going to be in hell forever, or you're going to be in heaven forever. So, we have the Seventh-day Adventists who think you have to repent of your sins. We have the Mormons who think you have to repent of your sins. We have the Jehovah's Witness, and we have the Buddhists. So, here's a, the reason I picked on that, and I'm, I'm going to continue going down the road, is, uh, or, or down the list, is the distinction has to be made, right? Because we are not ecumenical in our belief system. We are not, let's have everybody believe in the same God. We are Bible-believing Christians. We believe that the King James, for the English-speaking language, is the Word of God. And the Bible says that we have to be separate, that there's light and that there's darkness, and that we have to then, you know, it says the truth will set you free. It says study to show thyself approved. So, you know, so that we can be a workman, rightly dividing the word of truth, right? And so the thing that we have to focus on is if, if, if this repent of your sins was so important, wouldn't not, number one, wouldn't it be clear in the Bible, like the gospel message? And number two, why would then all the false religions preach it against the Bible? And, and, I, and I, I don't know if I made, the, made a, a good point there, but, you know, it doesn't matter. We're going to clear it up. The next one, before we get to that point, is the Pentecostals, which I don't know if you know much about Pentecostals. Basically, they're these big charismatic Christians that talk, talk in tongues and hold snakes. and depends on your, your, your idea of what a Pentecostal is, meaning there's so many of them, and they have these interesting beliefs. But basically, they even have oneness in their, in their belief system. And I'm not here to you know, go into Pentecostals. Uh, uh, you know, it's not a deep study, but those are the basic things that you're going to run into. But it says, they say in their website or in their main site, what is repentance? Repentance is, first of all, turning away from all sin. So there we go again. Apparently, there's this wall of sin. I guess they've been hanging around Trump too much because there's a wall of sin. And it's just like on one side only. And all you have to do is turn away from it and you're done sinning. That's it. You know, turn away from all sin. So far as this is first, uh, and so, so far... This is the first aspect is concerned. It closely resembles reformation. But repentance further involves turning to God and believing in prayer for forgiveness and cleansing from all sin. So they sprinkle half-truths everywhere and they make it sound really good. But if you really get to the gist of it, they're saying that it's a work salvation because they're saying there's something that you can do to get to heaven. You can be facing all this sin and all you got to do is just turn away from it and now you're in heaven. Notice none of these say Jesus Christ, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, John 3.16, John 3.18, John 5.24, John 1.12. I mean, none of these verses are even, and what's most interesting is that none of these even use verses, at least, I, I will give that, you know, if you go to the Christ Church, because, uh, you know, the, the idea is just to show the muttering of the water, but if you go to the Christ Church statement of belief, they give you the references of where they're getting their belief system. And it's a King James reference, you know, like Hebrews 9, 14 through 22, or Luke, or, you know, 1 Corinthians, or 2 Timothy. So they are giving you Bible references, but none of the false religions are. You know, I mean, uh, then you get to the contemporary New Age. And, I mean, I'm kind of being broad-stroked here. Contemporary, uh, you know, I'm talking about these new Calvinist movements, I'm talking about the health and wealth, I'm talking about the prosperity. So for me, I, instead of going deep into all these different ones, I just picked on the one here locally. I picked on Joel Falstein. And, you know, on April 1st, 2018, there was a, there's a YouTube clip, look it up. Just put Joel Olstein, Repent of Your Sins, or put Joel Olstein 2018 and there's a, literally a 1 minute and 42 second uh, video and to be honest with you, you probably ought to skip through it because he tells this horrible joke where he uses God's name in vain. And then literally, he finishes the joke. He says, I like to start my sermons light. And he tells this horrible Catholic joke about these four moms and their four Catholic sons and one's a priest, a father, and whatever. And I'm not going to even retell the joke because at the end, there's a, there's a, a blaspheme of God's word. I mean, uh, they, he uses it in, in vanity. And then immediately after he says this, he says, I'd like to give you an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. I mean, this is within a half second of ending this joke. He just turns to the camera. 
I didn't know what even was going on. I had to replay it. It says, I like to give you an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Would you pray with me? Just say, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. Come into my heart. I make you my Lord and Savior. And then that's it. And then he, the next sentence says, if you prayed that simple prayer, we believe you got born again. So think about the hundreds of thousands and millions of viewers that probably prayed that thinking that now they're saved, that now they're not lost. And so then next thing you know, we show up at their door, we ask them, are you 100% sure you're going to heaven? And then they say yes. And you ask them why, and they'll probably tell you because they, they prayed this prayer with Joel Osteen on TV. The challenge would be that, well, at least we're going to be there to soul win for them. But then we run into the issue, will they give us the time to present the clear gospel message? You know, it's not just enough to knock on the door. You know, they have to be willing to want to listen to the gospel message. And if they turn us away, well, then how much more turning away before they become a reprobate or they lose that opportunity? I hope not. I mean, I pray that we have a, a bigger revival and that we have a bigger uh, mega soul winning marathon and that we have more people saved because this is the kind of crap. This is the kind of junk that's out there. This is the kind of stuff that is just watering and mudding the water. And people walk around and they're like, oh, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven. I'm a Mormon, I'm going to heaven. I'm a Jehovah's Witness, well, there's no heaven, but we're going to live here, heaven on earth. You know, I'm a Buddhist, everything's great. You know, I'm a Pentecostal, I mean, the snake won't poison me, so I'm going to heaven. I don't know, contemporary New Age, I mean, that's probably the worst one of all. And then, you know, you pick on the Muslims, and by the way, we're not uh, Fox News Baptist, you know, I'm not looking to destroy Muslims. We, we like to go out there and lead them all to the Lord Jesus Christ. But the faith, the religion, uh, you know, the religion of the Muslims uh, is, uh, is a false religion. You know, uh, so, it, and, they, and if you go and you read their, their book, and I just got an excerpt from it about repenting of your sins, in Al-Nisa 4, 17 through 18, it says, Allah accepts only the repentance of those who do evil in ignorance and foolishness and repent soon afterwards. So he only accepts repentance if you did it by accident. It says, It is they whom Allah will for forgive, and Allah is ever all knower, all wise. And of no effect is the repentance of those who continue to do evil deeds until death faces one of them, and he says, Now I repent, nor of those who die while they are disbelievers. For them, we, we have prepared a pa painful torment. And, and let me, that's a very confusing sentence. And, and of no effect is the repentance of those who continue to do evil deeds until death faces one of them, and he says, now I repent. But if he doesn't repent, then they have painful torment for them. I, I, you know, that's why we don't read the Quran, because that's about as confusing of a sentence as it can be. But basically what it's saying is that you have to repent of your sins. And again, what is repent of your sins? What are they talking about? Is it, you know, some of them are more clear, at least the, the Mormons and the Muslims and, and even the Buddhists are telling you, look, you're going one way and you're, you're turning this way, but they're not clearly defining what they mean by that because they're saying, look, you're going to stop all this on this left side. This is all sin and there's no sin on this right side. And so you can stop this and you're going to come. Well, that's preposterous to think that there's no sin around you. But then you got other people who are saying, well, there is different forms of repentance and there's different ways of forgiveness and there's different ways of, of reformation and there's different ways of... The, and none of it has to do with salvation. So let, let me back up a little here real quick just to clear up a couple of things. We, or at least here, we believe in the repentance. We believe you have to repent of certain things. I mean, it would be dumb for me to get up here and tell you that repentance is not in the Bible when I just told you that it's in 85 verses and it's mentioned 88 times. But we're going to give you some Bible to show you what repent means and what the proper repentance is. Right? Because it's not repent of your sins. First of all, that's not found in there. So let's look at the Bible and let's apply what repent really means in our lives. So the first thing that we're going to look, go to Genesis 6, and then we're going to be in Matthew. Go to Genesis 6, and then we're going to be in Matthew. And if you turn to Genesis 6, we're going to see the first time the word repent is used. And it's used in the context of, uh, you know, God is, is turning from something. 
So my first question to all those that preach this repent of your sins, this conspiracy to muddy the water, to, to make the clear gospel message unclear is, you know, if you have to repent of your sins, does that mean that God, when he repented, repented of sin? Because if so, I mean, we know God is perfect. That would make him a sinner. Then what's the point of doing all this? What's the point of salvation? What's the point of Jesus Christ dying on the cross? I mean, that's about the dumbest thing that you could, you could talk about. You know, turn uh, Genesis 6, verse 6 says, And it repented the Lord. Who got repented? The Lord, that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creepy things and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. So the Bible is telling us that, G, that, I mean, that God turned or changed his mind about what he created because they were doing, if we read later on or for, uh, before, they were doing evil continually. There in uh, uh, verse 5 of uh, chapter 6, it says, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And so then, it repented him that he had made man on earth. So repent simply in its most uh, pure form just means to turn, to change. You know, God made man and he's like, look, they're just so evil that I'm just going to change. I'm going to turn and now I'm going to destroy them. And then later on we know that, you know, he found righteousness in Noah and he spared Noah and his family and then that was after the flood, but we're not going to go into that. So, what does repent mean? Well, we got to read it in context. We're not going to go through all the verses for the sake of time, but it's just turn to what? What is it that we're turning from? So we have to read the Bible in context to understand what is it that, that we were doing or direction we were facing, and what is it that we're turning from, and what is it we're turning to, right? Go to Matthew 3. Go to Matthew 3. And uh, go to Matthew 3, verse 1. And it says there in Matthew 3, verse 1, it says, In those days came John the Baptist. And we know that John came, you know, to preach of the coming of Jesus Christ. He came to lead the way. He was one crying out of the wilderness. He was one letting everybody know. And he says, in those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so that's the biggest argument I've gotten. They're like, well, how do you, the Bible tells you to repent, for the kingdom of, is at hand. So you have to repent to get saved. And stay with me, because we're going to let the Bible define the Bible. It says, For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So he's saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and he's preparing the way for Jesus Christ. If you go to Matthew 4, verse 12, <clears throat> we're going to see that same repentance used again. And it says there in verse 12 of Matthew 4, it says, Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came down and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast in the border of Zebulun and Nephthalim, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah, the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Nephthalim, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw light. And to them which sat in the region and a shadow of death, light has sprung up. From that time Jesus began to preach. So now Jesus is preaching to say, Repent, for the kingdom of, of heaven is at hand. So John the Baptist leads the way and says, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then we see that Jesus starts to preach. He begins his ministry by saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Let's go to Mark 1, verse 14. Go to Mark, and then after Mark, we're going to be in John. Go to Mark 1, we're going to be in verse 14. And it says, Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. So there's the kingdom we're talking about. And saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So what this is indicating to me is that they were believing in something erroneous. And the Bible says, turn or repent ye 
and believe in the gospel. So the only time that repentance is, is, uh, is necessary for salvation is when you go from your unbelief in the gospel to your belief in the gospel. See, because when you believe in anything outside of the gospel, it means that you're not believing on the gospel. Even when you believe on yourself or works, you know, did we not do great miracles in your name? Did we not heal in your name? Or, you know, we're tithing or we're like the, the Pharisee who says, well, I'm not like this publican, look at me, how great I am and all this. But, so we see that. Now, that's in the context of that. Now, if we were to take that word repent, you know, and, and you start to study it, in those 85 verses, let me just make sure, yeah, 85 verses in the 88 mentions, you've got to read it in the context of what it's talking about. Because basically it's just an instruction to turn. So we've got to know what we're turning from to know what, because the Bible says that it repented the Lord. And he got tired of repenting. And it repented him. And the Lord repenteth. And the Lord repenteth. And God repenteth. You know, if you just read the Old Testament, God's turning. And, and what it really is is that the, the people of Israel were always turning away from Him. And they were always in wickedness. And they were always committing sin. And they were always muddying the clear gospel message. Basically, they wanted to be like the world. And so they just, you know, conspired against the truth and told lies. Uh, you know, even we see uh, repentance when you're talking about, you know, Balaam and his conspiracy to tell lies and the fact that, you know, he was... Uh, he was an evil, you know, basically the doctrine of Balaam. We're not going to get into that. Sorry to get sidetracked. But let's look at something else. So go there to John 3 for the sake of time. It says, repent equals works. That's, that's my note here. Repent equals works. So, and I'm sorry, it's not John. I'm sorry. It's Jonah 3. I, I'm looking at my, accurate, my, my abbreviation here. It's Jonah 3. And then we're going to be, uh, just stay in Jonah. The, the other two verses we're going to read are, are, are popular verses that you know. Uh, but in Jonah 3, verse 6, it says, For the word came unto the king of Nineveh. So this is shortly after Jonah had preached that, you know, that, that it would be destroyed in 40 days. And we see that, that, they, that there's a change. And it says, so let me, let me, let's get to the, that part of the story. It says, for, in jo Jonah 3, 6, it says, For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him. This is the king mind you, and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd uh, nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn, let them turn every one from his evil way. So they're doing evil and they're turning. So that's the first point I want to make. They're turning from their evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent? So now God, what they're hoping for is that, they're, that if they turn from their evil ways, God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger. There's that word turn again. Turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not. Because remember, it was in 40 days that he was going to destroy it. So we're not talking about salvation. We're talking about a destruction, a uh, 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 cause and effect. And then keep reading there. It says, uh, fierce anger that we perish not. Verse 10, and God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. So we go back to verse 8. Turn everyone from his evil way, the king decreed. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he said that he would do unto them, and he did not. So what we see here is a lot of turning. You know, we see the king asking the, the people to turn from the evil, and we see that God is turning from destroying the, the city of Nineveh. So, and, and what did God call it? He said, and God, and God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. Now, how, let's make sure that the Bible backs up the Bible, that it's consistent, right? That, it, that, that what I'm trying to tell, that what I'm telling you, not what I'm trying to tell you, what I'm telling you is true. So if you go to Ephesians 2.8, which we read earlier, it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. That not of yourselves means that there's nothing, you can't repent of any of all your sins, and even if you did, it's not of you. But you can't. 
So there's no even if. It is the gift of God, not of works. So repent. God saw their evil works. I mean, God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. So those people repented of their works, their evil works, to good works. But God says there in Ephesians 2, 9, but it's not of your works, lest any man should boast. See, then there'd be the danger that the king of Nineveh and all the people would be like, look how great we are. And then it says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So see, the reason I picked that, the, the reason I kept reading there, it says, for we, have, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, then it's unto good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. See, there's nothing wrong with works, and actually there's nothing wrong with repentance, but when? It's in the sequence that it comes in. You know, excuse me. It's in the sequence that it comes in. You know, if, if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 4, 5, like we read, you know, the, the scripture for the, the, uh, for the sermon today says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him, that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted righteousness. And that's the next set of verses. But to him that worketh not, worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the, the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So all that someone has to do is believe. But once we believe, we don't necessarily have to work. There's tons of people that are going to get saved that will continue drinking and smoking and doing the things that they've done. And, and it's not until they get into a good, heart-preaching church and you know they, they get into listening to the things that you're not supposed to do from God's Word, not from my Word, from God's Word, that they make those decisions. But once you do that, it says, for we are, in Ephesians 2.10, it says, for we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, Step number one, unto good works. So the work comes after. So in other words, if you do repent after believe, it's because you know you, you sin and you ask God for forgiveness and you repent or you try to turn away from certain sins. And as you grow in grace, you know, if you were to look at my uh, lifestyle when I was 25 and I got saved to now, there's sins that I've repented of. But I haven't repented of all my sins. There's things that I don't... Uh, that I no longer do, but that doesn't mean that I'm not a sinner. I just don't partake in things that I used to partake in the world. And I'm not going to get into details because this is not one of those like where I'm going to get up here and tell you that God changed my life and so that's why I don't do this and don't do that. No, I do it because I want to because I read God's Word and He uh, instructs me and I want to obey God so that, you know, I get, I don't, I avoid the correction. You know, I don't like being chastised, if I can avoid it, but the Bible says that we enjoy chastisement or we rejoice in chastisement, and I believe it's because it's going to make us better for uh, His cause. See, if you're doing it just to get the applause of men or of women or of people, then you're doing it for the wrong reasons. But if you're, if you're repenting and you're changing things in your life so that you can be a better soul winner, so that you can grow in God's grace, so that you can do greater things for the Lord, then by all means, keep at it. But that has nothing to do, let me make that very clear, it has nothing to do, nothing, one iota, zero, zilch, nada, period, with being saved for all eternity. For all eternity. This weekend, you know, God blessed and we went out soul winning. We have a small group of soul winners here, but we went out soul winning and we let people to the Lord and they were so receptive. And the one thing that was clear every time was that it's just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You know, there's no, you have to do, there's nothing like that. And we're very careful, at least here in our church, to make sure that the gospel message is clear. Because all it takes is just a little leaven to leaven the whole lump. And what repent of your sins is, is a little leaven that leavens the whole lump. Because what it happens is that first of all, you can't, most people can't even define it. Everybody defines it different, but the end goal is to put the works on you. And most of the time it ends up being that even if it starts out light and lighter, most people end up moving, moving and moving and moving and moving to a, towards the wrong direction until they say, look, we have to lead a perfect life. Repent of all your sins to be saved. And that's not, that's not found anywhere in the Bible. Then, uh, you know, we look at it's a belief. Uh, it's belief, not repentance. So let's go to Matthew 27. 
Not about that. And we're gonna, and, and then we're gonna close out here. Matthew 27. And honestly, I mean, this is a, this was a tough message to write in the sense that there is so much said about repentance in the Bible that's correct that it, that there's so much that you could have just thrown out there to destroy and annihilate and eviscerate this repent of your sins doctrine that ruins people and makes them twofold the child of hell forever. Not for centuries or for days, but forever, for all eternity. But let's not get off track. Matthew 27, start reading there in verse 1. It says, When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and elder, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Now, we all know, if you've grown up in church, even in, even in the false churches, I grew up Seventh-day Adventist, and Judas Iscariot, we know, was not saved. I mean, anybody that's read their Bible will tell you that Judas was never saved. Not one, like, he was not saved and lost his salvation. He was never saved, period. So, then, you know, then that repent of your sins thing uh, would, would hold water here because it says he repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and the elder. All he did was change his mind. He gave him back the money. That's what he did. He took the money, and then he saw what he did, and he had a change of mind, and then he gave the money back. He turned around. Like, he repented of what he did. But the Bible is very clear, and I'm going to show you Scripture. That's why I started with that. And you don't have to turn there. John 6, 64 this is that famous, uh, I, I love this, this uh, set of scriptures because this is where God preaches a really strong message, you know, about salvation and about who he is and about how he's the, where Jesus preaches he's the son of God and how, you know, this is my flesh and, you, you know, you have to partake and this is my blood, you have to drink. And I'm not going to go into all that, but in 60, verse 64 of John 6, he says, But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew the beginning who they were that believe not and who should betray them who should betray him. And actually, I, I, I skipped over a couple of verses, but there's a verse that I like that I'm going to make emphasis on that, that, uh, that I didn't put in here, but now I am. You know, uh, If you go to John 6, we're going to keep reading there. Let's just read that whole section. 64, But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believe not and who should betray them. So he's talking about Jesus Iscariot. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except they were given unto him of my father. From that time, many of disciples went back and walked no more with him. See, when you preach a message like this, it might be that from that time, this time forward, many people that listen uh, here in church or that uh, listen through the uh, YouTube channel or stuff might not walk with us anymore because this repent of your sins is something that's popular in the world. It says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Listen to this. Then it said, Jesus unto the, uh, the twelve, ye also, will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. See, I would rather preach the truth because the truth is in the words of eternal life. See, I want to I want to make sure that the people that listen to what I have to say when I'm door knocking, that I that listen to what we have to say when we're preaching the word of God from behind the pulpit, it all leads to the eternal life of Jesus. You know, Jesus Christ gave us that eternal life. It says in verse 69, and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, that Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them. Uh, <clears throat> verse 70. This is another. This is where we're going to prove that. Uh, Judas was never saved. I just, I got a little rabbit trail. But there in uh, verse 7, he says, Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil. So, I mean, we know the devil's not saved, and even the devils aren't saved, and one of you is a devil. He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he that should betray him, being one of the twelve. So the fact that someone can repent of something they did wrong and just turn around doesn't mean that they're saved. They're, they may be the sons of devils. That has nothing to do with anything. 
You know, if you look, and, and, and I proved it to you, you know, after false religion, after false religion, after false religion, I just glossed over them be, for the sake of time because each one of these requires their own sermon. But, you know, if you go to John 17, 12, it says, While I was with them in the world, uh, you know, you know, actually, don't turn there. I'm just going to close this out. John 17, 12 and Matthew 26, 24 says, While I was with you in the world, I kept them in my name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost. But the son of perdition, that's talking about Judas Iscariot, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And then we see Mark, Mark, Matthew 26, 24. The son of man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. And that's talking about Judas Iscariot. So I want to make that point clear that just because the Bible uses the word repent, then it has nothing to do with salvation. You know, and actually almost all the time it means just turn. At times it'll mean change, turn or like a change of mind or a change of heart. But at the end, its simplest, purest form is just to turn. You're going in one direction, now you're going in another direction. Now I'm going to the right, now I'm going to go to the left. I'm going north, now I'm going south. I was going down, now I'm going up. I'm going up, now I'm going down. So I think the big thing that we need to preach again is people need to stop worshiping their own perceived righteousness. See, because the challenge is that when you're talking to someone about this stuff, when you're talking about this work salvation, they'll say, oh, I believe in Jesus. You know, maybe was it last week or two weeks ago, I was, we were talking to this lady when we were soul winning. And she's like, oh, I believe in, in salvation, but, you know, uh, well, what if you, uh, you know, I, I don't, I go to church and, you know, I try not to lie anymore and I try not to do these things. But so you're saying that a murderer or a rapist could believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and go to heaven? I'm like, yeah. See, the problem is, she's not saying me who lies sometimes or has evil thoughts or gets in a fight with my husband. No, because that's not perceived as evil or as bad as, you know, being a whoremonger or an idolater or a sorcerer. The challenge is that we pick and choose these, we make up in our mind, and I'm talking about the world, these, these sins that, I mean, these are evil, evil. We, we kind of create levels of morality. That's sinful. What I do, well, I mean, I'm saved and I'm trying to lead a good life. But the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And, you know, just to show you how ridiculous this thought is of repent of your sins, you know, is that uh, I went and I did like a, like a fifth, fifth grade school project. And because uh, I'm a visual learner. And when, when I had this struggle with why these guys preached against repent of your sin, and why this doctrine, from both sides, it, it, and it wasn't just, uh, you know, from the guys who were preaching the truth, but then you'd hear it from the false religions, and, and you, you wonder why everybody's picking a side, is because there is a false religion that's out there, that, and there's, I mean, actually, there's false religions that want you to muddy the water so that you don't get saved. See, you say, oh, I don't believe that, you know, I have family members who are still Seventh-day Adventists, and they're like, just leave them be. You know, they're not hurting anybody, they're not doing anything to anybody, as a matter of fact, some of those guys are better people than you are. They lead better lives than you do. They're much nicer than you ever will be. Uh, okay, you can think that, but I'm not leading anybody to hell, not consciously and not unconsciously, because I'm secure in my salvation. And if somebody asks, I'm going to give them the salvation message that's found in the Bible. I'm not going to go around thinking that I'm all pious while people are going to hell in a handbasket left and right. You know, so... What I did here is I just created a visual. And I took the eight sins that we find in, in uh, Revelation 21.8. You know, it starts there with the, the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters. And all liars shall have their part in the, in the, uh, in the lake of fire, right? And thank God my wife uh, had a birthday party for her son and, and the theme was... Uh, whatever, Paul Bunyan, what is this, uh, uh, whatever, this woodman. She gave it a, I forget what he's called, but it doesn't matter. He's a woodman, and this is really a nutcracker, but, because I didn't want to use my, my daughter's doll. But the reason that I did this is because it's almost comical the way this looks. But hell is not comical. And you've got to break this down to the ridiculous to May help people realize how ridiculous it is to go out there and have people preach repent of your sins. And then the, the fact that if it's that ridiculous and people are actually 
anchoring themselves behind a belief system like that, that that's necessary for salvation, makes you wonder how wicked they really are. Because, I mean, if you break down, you know, if my son or my daughter, as they get older, when they start to talk, come to me and, and they come to me with something really ridiculous and they're grounded on it, that's the truth, you know, I can understand that to an extent and we'll, we'll talk it out because they're children. But when an adult comes to you with the same kind of imagination, for example, you know, one of the common things in children is to have imaginary friends. Well, we're going to work that out. And the, the, the idea is for my daughter or my son or anybody or anybody's children not to have imaginary friends. But that's part of, you know, the growing process. But if a grown man or woman comes to me and says that they're sitting next to their imaginary friend, that's not only ridiculous, that's dangerous. You know, we might laugh at it initially, but you've got to think about this, the mental problems that individual has. So think about the mental problems these individuals have when they're like, repent of your sins to be saved. When the reality is that it's all you have to do to be saved is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the other thing is, it's not a wall. That's the reason that I kept pointing on one side and the other is because we don't live in a wall of sins. There's not this wall of sins we're walking towards and behind us we're leaving all sin behind. We're surrounded by sin because the flesh is, we, we live in our flesh. You know, there, I don't know what I'm going to go when I go to work or when I walk into the grocery store or when I pick up the phone or when I turn on uh, the computer and I do a Google search. What's going to pop up that could trigger my mind to have a bad thought or a sinful thought, right? If I'm driving down the highway and there's a, uh, a picture of a half-naked woman, what kind of thoughts would my mind go into? You know, I can't avoid the world. I'd have to be a hermit. You know, and I'm sorry, I keep holding this, but, you know, the idea is, let's put this guy in here, and, you know, I'm, I'm five foot, five and a half, so I'm going to have to tippy toe or stand on this thing. But the repenting of your sins is stupid because you're never going to be, able, what are you repenting of? Like, let's say that this individual here is an idolater because we're going to pick on the Catholics. You know, I didn't even pick on the Catholics for this one. And I'm, I'm pretty sure it's all in there, but... They're an idolater, and you tell them, that, and they say, okay, well, I have to believe that I have to repent of my sins to uh, be saved. Well, what's stupid is that when you repent, you're just turning. Well, guess what? Now you're walking into another set of sins. Now you're walking into something abominable. Or maybe you turn, and now you're a liar. Or maybe you see that billboard, or you go to the bar like you shouldn't be because you think that Jesus hung around in bars, and that's where you should be preaching the gospel. And there's uh, scantily women and whores, and you become a whoremonger. Or you become a, a murderer, or a sorcerer, or you unbelieving, or fearful. I mean, the thing is, you're not going to get out of this cage of sin. You're surrounded by sin from 360. So you're walking one way and you repent. You're gonna... Now the idea is that eventually, maybe you can knock down some of these, Right? So, for example, you know, I'm not going to go into, like I said, I'm not going to go into details, but there's sins that I just, I don't partake in anymore. That when I was part of the world, you know, I did those things, and I no longer do them. But that does not mean that I've stopped sinning. I'm still a sinner. There's still things that I struggle with. There's still things that I have to ask God to forgive me of my sins. There's still things that I have to, you know, overcome. The only repentance is, you know, if you repent, towards the gospel, right? That you believe on the gospel. And this guy's head doesn't turn here, but if this guy was looking to himself or looking to these sins or these works for salvation, and all of a sudden, uh, and I'm using this guy, the, the, for the sake of the example, and if they just turn and put their faith, they turn towards Jesus Christ for the, the, the saving blood of Jesus Christ, and they put their faith and trust on Jesus Christ. That's it, period. There is nothing else that can secure eternal life but by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I mean, I really wanted to close out with a bunch of verses like that, but I knew that this, is, this was going to be a longer sermon than no normal. All we have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, we use those a lot. I'll, I'll close out with that, and then we'll go from there. And I'm going to show you that when the Bible talks about salvation, it, it doesn't use the word repent all that often. And when it does, it comes back to the gospel, like I showed you in the beginning. But I love these when we use them. John 3, 16 through 18 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth 
on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Not this, but for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He, and I love 18, verse 18 of John 3.16 is just probably like, hello, ding dong, you know, the bells are going off because it says, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the Son of the only, uh, in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So, you know, because they're in their belief and they haven't turned to the belief then they're, they're condemned already. So the only way to not be condemned is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. I hope this uh, was helpful. At least it was helpful to me. And, and I hope it, it's helpful to a lot of people who struggle with sometimes, you know, the mudding of the water. And the reason I struggled with it, let me just make a couple of things clear, is when you're new to the faith and you've grown up and you're listening to a lot of stuff, there's a lot of misinformation. That's why it's so important to get into the Word. You know, the only time that the things aren't confusing is when you open the Word of God and you read His Word. You know, when you go through every verse of repent, and, you know, we, we're not going to go through that for the sake of time again, but if you were to go through all that, you, you'd, it'd be, you'd be dumb to think that repent of your sins can lead you to salvation. You'd be dumb to think that there isn't a conspiracy. You'd be, you know, it, you'd be like, how in the world is this not a conspiracy? Why does it, how did this, it's such a conspiracy, it's so secretive that I actually typed in, repent of your sins, origin. When was the first time repent of your sins was used? And I mean, I couldn't, it's, all it, all it kept leading me to was like the definition of repentance or how you can repent to be of your sins. WikiHow has a whole thing on how you can repent of your sins. Step one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So anyways, let's close in a word of prayer.